how effective uh, are our policies as far as uh, these partnerships and neighborhood policies are concerned? They're not too effective. Huh? Let's, let's be lucid about it. They, they can very much be improved. Uh, there is, of course, a need to have a more defined idea of what our view is. And it is true that some of the countries, especially the, the newcomers, have, let's say, a very geostrategic view, uh, insisting a lot on uh, stability created by more engagement, while some of the others, let's say the older partners, insist upon a logic of, uh, yeah, but uh, we need to be orthodox about this, because uh, uh, coming closer to a club also means that you have to, uh, to respond to, or, or that you have to uh, follow some, some of the, the rules of the games, and it is clear that in a lot of these countries, for example, rule of law, well, it has to be seen with a lot of pragmatism. So there is today a need to come to more common analysis, and that is one of the things I said in, in, in my advices. I think that the European Action Service, if it can do one thing, it is before trying to come to the same conclusions, let's get our facts straight, let's get our analysis straight. And let's have a good look at what we feel about these countries and try to blend it into uh, a common view. Uh, when you, when you uh, synthesized my position as saying rapprochement is enough, I did not really say that. I think some of these countries have a European vocation. I honestly think that. I only say neighborhood policy and rapprochement is valuable in itself. If we if we do the mistake of thinking that rapprochement or neighborhood is only useful if it ultimately leads to membership, then we, we, uh, we lose the, the opportunity to, to use neighborhood policy as, a, as an instrument which is valuable in itself. So when you say rapprochement is enough, I, I honestly think that having more rapprochement can be extremely useful and, and has to be uh, followed up. You have abs you're absolutely right that I should have mentioned Turkey, I do it all the time, because uh, as a Belgian uh, minister, you can understand we are very multilateral. We are very based in a tradition of multilateralism. And this means trying to outreach, to go to countries that are not necessarily exactly of your point of view, but trying to get them along in, in some of your objectives. And it is clear that Turkey, especially when it comes to the Arab awakening, but all, not only to uh, in the Arab awakening, with uh, discussions on non-proliferation with Iran, for example, uh, with their new found uh, confidence 360 degrees around looking at uh, the rest of the world with the, uh, the view that they can play a role Europe could make, make a big mistake not to acknowledge that their role in NATO for example so I absolutely agree that uh, they are an important partner now when you said could you imagine joint action between the European Union and Turkey without UN resolutions or at least when you see that your, your work on UN resolutions does not work. There, as a Belgian, I will always defend the logic that I will always look legitimacy within the European, uh, within the United Nations. You have to understand that. For us, it's in our uh, DNA, how do you say that? Uh, uh, it's in our genes. We absolutely think that the multilateral framework, and it's all already a, a second time that I, I already uh, precurse on the, on the fifth question, we always think that our security as Belgians is best served in a world where the multilateral, accountable, previsible uh, environment is best organized. We do not think that uh, we can organize that better by doing it ourselves. We are too modest sized for that. And we do not think that we can do that with uh, a lot of bilateral relations. We think that the multilateral is the best way to go about. So we would, even in a logic of European Union and Turkey doing something on Syria, we as Belgians, we would be pushing towards uh, having a UN uh, resolution, for example. And that is the thing on which I see it also as a challenge. If we see today that, for example, the Arab League or some of the new, uh, uh, new arrivals in the Security Council, that they are more reserved on uh, uh, voting uh, resolutions, well, we simply say to ourselves, we have to convince them. We need not to say uh, we will never be able to convince South Africa that if they had uh, the advantage of having a world that said gedaan uh, met apartheid, that now it's their turn to, to think about 
uh, engaging and not being indifferent, I think that this discussion is more worthwhile than simply saying, if they don't want to go along, let's, let's forget about it. So we will continue to work on, on creating more uh, consensus about that. And I, I feel that I always come back to the fifth question. Uh, the fifth question I want to respond, uh, point besoin d'espérer pour entreprendre, ni de réussir pour persévérer. One has to acknowledge that what you say is right. There is still a lot of uh, uh, lack of decis decisiveness and, and, and uh, there is a lot of division. But have a look at the situation during the Cold War, when no Security Council resolution was voted. No resolution whatsoever on, on issues comparable to what is happening now, for example, in the in the Arab environment. Nothing. If there was not the veto of the Russians, there was the veto of the Americans or, or something else. If you have a look at the situation today, when it comes to the principle that Ban Ki-moon presented, the responsibility to protect, which a lot of people considered as being academic, uh, eh? Libya was the application of the principle of responsibility to protect. It was the world that said, we're not going to stand by while people get shot in the streets because they, they ask democratic rights. So I accept your criticism, but I say that even if looking at the, the lack of successes, and I know, I know some examples of it, but let's have a look at the, the evolution. And even in the, the, su the subject matter that has not yet been touched in questions or in my own uh, expose, the Middle East peace process, I will surprise you, but I will tell you that I think that Catherine Ashton has been able to get into a situation where, differently than in the past, where we always said, yeah, it's the Americans that are in the driver's seat and we are supportive, that today, when it comes to the Middle East peace process, thanks to the efforts of Catherine Ashton, Europe is at least also in the driver's seat. And you might call me naive, and I think we will also have a lot of failures on our way. But I do believe that more and more people are getting convinced that the only way that the European Union is going to have an influence in the world, the influence that is according to its, its economic wealth, the only way to do it is to get more united. And do not forget that it took a century before the United States of America became a singular. We're not a plural. For a very long time, the United States of America, you had to use the, the, the verb in, in its plural. They, they have... The United States has, that is something of a recent past. And the European Union is something that is busy for, what, six decades, something like that. So we keep going on, and it's you. It's you who is going to continue the, the work to create more uh, common uh, policy in the future. Um, a very interesting question, because I, I went to the fifth, coming back to the third. A very interesting question on can I give a little bit more information about how do you see this strategic partnership? Well, that is one of the big problems today that we tackle uh, and that I uh, uh, synthesized by saying Herma van uh, uh, told us, uh, well, now we have strategic partners, that's very good, and now we need strategy. The problem is that today, when it comes to identifying your own interests, we do not have a common view. I do believe that when I speak to my Chinese colleague, when I speak to my Indian colleague, when I speak to my Brazilian colleague, he has a set of things he wants to get of me, uh, achieve from me. And I must recognize that today the Belgian minister has his small list of things that interest him. But it's not necessarily the same as what the German minister has to say or what the French minister has to say. And our partners, of course, they sense that. Of course they sense that. And the, 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 the solution is, is clear. We need to get more assertive about our priorities, but we need to identify them. And the External Action Service on uh, what has been asked of the 27 to create that. And to create that, it will not be by unanimity. <laughs> That's the reason why I told you that at one point, we're going to push Cathy Ashton or her successor or whoever. At one point, we will have to push the high representative towards a vision which is even more political, saying, listen, I've talked to everybody, I talked to 27 countries, and I think that this is the main focus. 
And if somebody does not agree entirely, okay, next time you will probably have more influence on the direction. We, with a lot of effort, I was able to conclude the free trade agreement with South Korea during uh, my presidency as a, the Belgian Minister for Trade, and I had to convince very late in the night the last member state, uh, everybody knows it's Italy, so I can, I had to convince that they had to understand that solidarity between member states cannot mean veto right. At one point, one has to acknowledge that going forward is a value in itself, and that holding back our decisions is creating lack of uh, progress. So it will be about that. Sorry for not being more specific, but that is the, the, the trend of our reflection. When you said um, that I spoke about the European diplomacy superseding national diplomacies, I think you, you, you did not misquote me, but, I, but you, I think I must have expressed myself not very uh, accurately then, if you had that impression. In my view, it's not about superseding. It is about having a good look at complementarity. I honestly think that national diplomacies will continue to exist as long as sovereignty is there. I see a lot of areas where I'm absolutely convinced <coughs> that in decades to come, there will be a Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of Belgium, who will continue to push forward the priorities of the, the Belgian people, the, the Belgian citizens, the Belgian businesses, when it comes to foreign policy. When I speak about the External Action Service, it's about an instrument that can mobilize the complementarity value of doing things together but always based on a logic that is respectful of the, of the internal uh, competences and respectful of the fact that we are sovereign nations. We're not going to become a, a, a kind of a United States of Europe with, with one single government. Perhaps, uh, perhaps your grandchildren will live it, uh, not me. Uh, but keeping to the logic of sovereignty keeping to the logic of sovereignty, does not mean that you can close yourself in your actions. And, and the example that I gave with, with Haiti, Haiti is a, is a nice example for a Belgian Minister of Foreign Affairs because it comes to that, we were the first to be in Haiti. The Belgian help forces were the first to be there. We were that efficient, <coughs> we were that capable of, of giving help that everybody recognized that the Belgians were there first. Okay. What is the value of Belgians being there first? If next, French, Germans, Luxembourg... What is the real value for the people having had the, the effects of, a, of an earthquake? It's of getting effective and efficient help. And discussing how you can do things together is not about letting yourself supersede. It's not that. It's about joining forces. It's a cooperative strategy. This is a, because the fifth question I came back uh, each and every time on it, it was a very good one. Uh, but uh, sorry that I used Willem de Zwijger to, uh, to give an answer to that, uh, to that question. <laughs>